And must I say continue? Yes. Okay, I said continue. There you go. Now it is being recorded. Uh -huh. So, good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> yes, <laughs> afternoon here. Fine. Morning with you, yes. <laughs> okay, to start off with, would you like to just uh, say your name and where you are? Uh, Jochen Lohmeyer, I am at present in Berlin. Hmm. And a little tiny bit about yourself? Uh, gosh, <laughs> about myself. Um, I, I mean, um, I don't know how deep to go, so I'll, I'll try. Um, I think I had quite, uh, I've been told a uh, repeated number of times that I had a quite difficult uh, childhood. I was born five years after the Second World War. Uh, my father came home with a wooden leg and he was quite a disappointed, gruntled man. Um, my mother was, was very kind, but not enough protective for me. So um, I came out as somebody who is not really emotionally grounded in themselves. Yeah? So I, I developed the strength of um, being analytical, critical in my head, which is not bad. Um, but I'm also a little bit fearful um, in this, so um, that is that is quite a a basis con basic configuration which I carry and yeah carry on. <clears throat> I also came from a from an area um, uh, rural. My parents uh, grew up in the same village um, and uh, they lived there through the Second World War. Um, my father was had abject poverty and hunger um, in the 1930s with the Great Depression. Um, so, um, but there were large families. My mother were nine, uh, my father were five. Um, so I, um, I um, we lived in a small town where my father was a teacher, uh, but we commuted back to the village all the time, weekends, and um, so I grew up in two places, so to say. I had a, a, a weekend place, which was the family and village, and um, with a very special slang, which um, my first wife, who was also, also German, um, needed in, an interpreter to understand. Um, so <laughs> very strange Cologne area. It's, it's a, yeah. And um, so, uh, and, and then during the week, we commuted to where we lived as a small family. Um, and I sort of developed the ability to, um, to look into things as, oh, there is another side. There is, it's green on the other side of the fence, yeah? Um, and, um, and then um, I was, at the, at the age of 15, I was sent to England to improve my English for four weeks. 15 years old, uh, uh, to a family. And they were very kind of me, uh, to, with me. And when I came back, I discovered um, that I could parrot languages. I had no idea about that. So um, it, it sort of reinforced my ability to live in different worlds. And I, I, I speak quite a lot. I speak um, French and Russian and Swahili and, um, not too well, but sufficient, but I can pair it. So that even on the phone, if I, if I talk in Tanzania, um, people wouldn't expect that I'm not black. Mm. Yeah, so that's, but it's a, it's a parroting ability and not something very substantial. Um, so that, that is the second characteristic. Um, and the third one is probably, um, I grew up in, in, a, in a staunchly Catholic surrounding. Um, I was an altar boy. Um, at the age of 17, I um, went to exercises, which is a, a word for Catholic retreats. Um, and uh, that was with, with the Jesuits, which is a strong order. And um, I really contemplated to join. Um, so I could have been the like Pope Francis now, yeah, being, <laughs> he's a Jesuit. Um, but then, then came 
um, the first girlfriend and sex and dancing and drinking and whatnot. And I went into complete rebellion. I left the church. My mother almost had a heart attack. Um, and then um, I can remember the first time that I brought home a weekly magazine, Der Spiegel, which is quite well known and established. And it's sort of a liberal magazine, um, even here, not a left wing one. And my father was almost in hysterics that I would read these things. Um, it was the time of rebellion. Um, I was a rebel, um, and not only against the church and whatnot, against uh, that the parents did not say a lot about their past, the fascist past, which they didn't have. Uh, they were Catholic, conservative, um, no attachment, um, which is yeah, one of the good parts of being stable <laughs> and, re and, and remote. Um, they, were, they, they were not pulled. Um, but it was also time of the Vietnam War. So um, after school, I moved to Berlin. And that was the, at that time, was the height of the student revolution in Berlin, uh, which was a little bit like the flower power movement in the US. But um, so I joined. And half of my study was reading Karl Marx. Um, although I studied languages, Russian and English, and I studied geography um, to become a teacher because I, I couldn't decide what I wanted to be. Um, and my father was a teacher and all that. And it was the time when uh, teachers were very rare. There was a big um, opportunity for me as a student to teach at schools. And I had like, um, I had, um, um, I had 10 lessons a week a normal teacher had 24. So from the beginning, I was working and studying. I earned a hell of a lot of money uh, for, for that time, yeah, um, by working. I could buy a deux chevaux, a Citroën deux chevaux, you know, this, this little humpy <laughs> cars, new one, yeah, uh, when I was in the sixth semester or so. I, it was really fantastic. But um, what stays from there is, I joined a movement to make the world a better place by improving those who have been disadvantaged. And that I think is a third characteristic of mine. I've stayed with that. I carry a lot of hope. Um, being the critical thinker that I am, having difficulties with being emotionally settled, uh, but I've been looking for alternatives and more on the left wing side um, all my life. Hmm. Okay. Is there a, a particular person who you've run into in all of these different phases of life that you would say really influenced or marked you? Not a particular person. Um, probably uh, two events which, <laughs> which um, were very particular for the time. Um, the Berlin Free University had a collaboration agreement with the Leningrad University. And as students of Russian, we could go to Leningrad, which was completely unusual at that time, Cold War, uh, for four weeks. And I went with a group of students and I went twice, one as a member, uh, the next time as a tutor. Um, and it was mind blowing to be in a completely different society, you know, where old babushkas like grandmothers were the professors and they looked like old grandmothers and they were old grandmothers in their personal relationships where um, uh, people were not allowed to drink in the streets and everybody had like a paper bag and inside the paper bag was a bottle of vodka and you knew the bottle would be empty by the end of the day where people sat in the metro and um, were reading big volumes of Russian classic literature, uh, where people struggled to get a, a, a living space, a flat, and they agreed to live in what they called communal quarter, communal flats, where one room for one family. And I got to know um, an actor who was actually gay, and he pro forma married a girl 
in order to get a place to stay in Leningrad. Mm. And it was so different. The whole consumerism wasn't there, did not exist. You went into a shop, had to queue, and you had to know where is what's where is sold what at what time. And then you ran there and yeah, you got an ice cream or you got a book or whatever you wanted. Um, and it was it was a completely different society. And I was fascinated just by the difference. And uh, and being respectful for for what we saw, yeah, not being non-judgmental was quite a challenge because you bring in your own ideas and oh it's different. <laughs> yeah, but it was a good position. And the other one, um, yeah, and so I learned I learned um, Russian well um, to the stage where I worked as an interpreter um, and and um, did excursions to Russia in the later. So yeah, and that is 45 years ago. I've forgotten all. It's somewhere very deep down, and I can probably unearth it now as uh, as I have time. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. The second thing was um, also related to traveling. Um, I hitchhiked through the Sahara from Berlin um, to Taman Raset in southern Algeria. And uh, we did a camel tour for three weeks with a Tuareg guide. Um, and that was the first time when I got introduced to matrilinear societies where we were taken to a small place on the traveling through the desert on camel backs from one well where we had a bag, a goat bag, which we filled up with water and we had dried tomatoes and little things and we made a meal every evening, slept under the sky. And I was introduced to um, a lady who, um, in a village, yeah, and the village was a couple of huts and um, she was very clearly the boss of this place. And our guide put his long 15 meter shawl around his neck and only could, you could only see his eyes. And that was how the, the tradition prescribed. Yeah? And, and the woman was very, yeah. <laughs> so um, that, is, yeah. And then I, I traveled, I, um, I did my PhD research in uh, East Africa and Tanzania. I was completely mesmerized by how kind people were, by the hospitality, by um, the language. Yeah, I, I learned a little bit of Swahili and later I learned, I learned it quite well. Um, when I came back to Berlin after such trips and went into a supermarket, I had to get out because it, I got nauseous from this oversupply and the multitude of things. So I was, a, I was quite attracted. So that, that yeah, impacted me much more than a specific person. And so and what, I'm sorry, what did you do um, with this, this traveling? What has been your, your project or your way of working or what, what have you done with all of this? <laughs> So um, I studied, um, I was a teacher when I was a student mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, it, it was enough. I didn't want that anymore. So I, I, I did economics um, and became a planner, a development planner. Okay. And I worked in East Africa, in Tanzania for eight years um, as a local planner. And that, um, that involved quite a lot of, um, that's probably a good way of um, of telling you my transition from being a technocrat, yeah, where I had to know maps and statistics and economics and could calculate and um, and all of these abilities were based on the availability of data. Okay. Uh, you cannot calculate feasibility and whatnot if you don't have figures. Right. In Tanzania, there were no figures. So as a planner, there was no way that you could do it on your desk. You had to go to people. So we organized planning meetings 
with government, of course, government officials, but also with focus groups and with entire villages. And what I learned at that time was how to facilitate, how to facilitate so that people could voice their priorities, which then we would take up and put that into the plan. Mm -hmm. um, so th there was this, this, um, this empathy and the, the curiosity about how is, how is it in a different place, yeah? The, the greener side of the other, the greener other side of the fence. Um, and there was a lot of um, dedication, sort of, yeah, social commitment that we wanted to do something that was beneficial for people. And that went, only went with people. So I, I give you examples. Um, we had, a, um, a, the, the, the government had a certain budget and the budget wasn't enough for everybody. So the villages were asked to come up with priorities, like three, four, five priorities over the next year so that that could be supported, not funded completely, but supported. So they, they came up with, we need a new water supply, which is a well or, yeah, or we need another room in our primary school. Right. And so our offer was, if you can agree, then we will support all the materials that are needed. And because there are um, peak seasons, but there are also slack season in the ag agricultural cycle, you organize yourself, provide the labor, and then you build whatever you want to build. You know, that, that is, is an example. And um, we needed not only the consent in terms of the priorities, but we needed the commitment that people would come and work. Um, and that is quite a facilitative task. If you think of how different interests in a community of 2000 people works, yeah. So um, I learned to facilitate. Um, that was very helpful. It was mainly sort of behaviorist kind of communication. And um, then I got into trouble. And the trouble was, um, you can imagine you sit um, in the full sun for a whole day of 2000 people in front of you with a table and uh, you sit behind the table and because with a village chief and you facilitate priorities, find your priorities. So it was about ask everybody what are the priorities and usually the hierarchy in the village is very clear, it's paternalistic. Uh, so my special attention was on the women, for example. Yeah. So I said, okay, I've seen the women that are sitting under these bushes and uh, for now the whole morning and can they please also come and say something? And the village chairman says, oh, young man, at that time, yeah, I was young, a young man, um, you may not yet be uh, very um, accustomed to our uh, customs, um, please, um, let us speak for the women, because that is our tradition. And I got quite annoyed internally. I could manage myself, you know. But then there was another, and, and I sent my, my female colleague yeah, to sit with the women, and then she talked, and so we sorted that out. But then there was another situation which I remember quite distinctly, was in a, um, also in a rural place which was very dry. Um, a group of people, like a third of the whole population set together, but separate from the others. And after a while I asked, what is, what is the matter with these? And the person, the, per, the village chairman said, the, ha, those have no voice. I said, what, are they deaf or what, what's? And after blah, blah, blah came out, they are slaves. Ah. And there was a story because these were people who were from a different area, from like 500 kilometers, kilometers away, which had had a drought and they had migrated without anything, just for survival. And they were staying in this place. And I asked for how long? Oh, 30 years, they said. They, had no, they didn't own fields. They were just working on fields of others. And they were just ordered around because they were dependent on food supplies. Mm -hmm. 
So they were slaves. And that was sort of beyond my level of tolerance. So I actually got into trouble with this village and this village chairman because I, you can't have slaves, sorry. It's against the constitution. And, um, and after that, I realized, because the, then the meeting sort of went almost bust. Yeah? It, nothing came out and we didn't get the motivation that we needed to implement. Um, so after that, I decided I want to have the ability, if I am facilitating a group, if I am or dealing with a group, here's the group and here's me, I want to be able to separate myself out from myself and mm -hmm. look at me and the group, like a triangulation. And after my job in Berlin, uh, after I had returned in Berlin, uh, to Berlin, and we had, um, and I, I, I did for 15 years, I did management training for people from third world countries who were working with German development aid. Um, I looked for somebody who could teach me something in this regard. And the only person I found was a Canadian woman uh, from Alberta, who was married to a German professor of psychology, the only professor for Gestalt psychology. And uh, she was part of the Berlin Gestalt Pedagogics Institute. And she could speak English. We were a team of about 10 people. And I said, Shirley, please teach me something that I don't know. And can you do that? Yeah. And I tested her. I said, please demonstrate to me that you can teach me something that I don't know. So Shirley said, Jochen, you may not have remarked, but when you asked me this, you said, can you teach me something that I don't know? I see you shake your head. That is what your body does. And it's different to what you say. So I think you doubt that I can do this. So I now deal with your doubt. I don't answer your question. <laughs> and I was like, okay, <laughs> that I had no idea about. <laughs> Probably just learned something, right? So um, we did um, one and a half years course and they called it because in, in pedagogics, they were dealing with teachers and supervising teachers. They called it supervision training. Today, one would probably say group coaching. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it was a quite solid introduction to Gestalt and to the tools, the methods of Gestalt. And I've always been a tools person. I love tools. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, I went on with that. Um, and then um, the, the, it went further to... Um, we joined together with Shirley and a whole group. We joined the, at that time, Cleveland International Organizational Development Program, Organization and Systems Development Program, IOSD, uh, at Nevis. And um, in both, in, in the course that we did with Shirley and then in the IOSD, I took along three African colleagues who we sort of shared the financing, yeah. Um, and it was absolutely amazing, um, the, the development of these partly traditional but very modern people um, to get introduced into a world that they had no idea existed. So we learned together with them and we're still working together, but um, um, I think after Fritz Perls left South Africa, where he, he you know, he, he uh, mm -hmm. left during the war in Joburg, in Johannesburg, um, that was the first time that Africans got introduced to Gestalt. Uh, and um, and I'm, I'm actually quite proud of this little thing, yeah, um, to have brought this back. So we did the, um, the Cleveland course, another one and a half years on organizational development with John Hannafin and a couple of other people. And then um, I got 
um, and then we did the uh, we did the Cape Cod model um, with with uh, Sonia, and that was a big learning for me because she introduced me to this idea of how can you not be critical, how can you see what drives a system, yeah. And I found this absolutely marvelous. It still costs me a lot of energy to do this, but yeah, uh, we did that. And um, and we organized for people to come to, um, uh, in 2000, I moved to Cape Town. Um, and um, we organized for people to come and teach with us. Um, so um, Edwin and Sonia came, we did the Cape Cod model, and then Joe Melnick and and Stuart Simon did the second part. So we did the whole range from uh, model one, uh, Cape Cod model one, two, coaching, organizational consulting. Um, and we did, um, Hannafin and, and Marianne Rainey came for giving an introduction to Gestalt, which um, brought a lot of Africans into the program. So it was, um, it was very, exciting to be um, to be a catalyst for spreading Gestalt into this new continent where it had been before but had then moved to the States. And so is this within organizational and development areas or yeah, yeah, yeah. Clinical there, is, there is until now no therapist as far as I know in in Africa in on the whole continent no therapist uh, gestalt therapist and very few real therapists. I mean, people who have done psychology plus an equivalent therapy training. Very rare. Very rare. Okay. I, I don't know. I couldn't say otherwise. I'm, yeah. I'm curious. Well, the last, the last uh, South African therapist who, who was well trained, Jerry Levine, he left uh, for the States long mm -hmm. ago, if 95 or so. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm curious about how you have managed this entire situation and coming and going in terms of power dynamics, in terms of power as a European white, blue eyed man and things like that, how, how that has been for you. I mean, it's something that it, it just really sort of jumps out at me. I think, um, Okay, one of my colleagues from uh, from South Africa, but he he grew up in Nigeria. He said the other day to me, "You're the blackest white who I've ever seen." Okay. So there, there's something um, which is also um, my my ability to parrot languages, and um, my ability to to be confident in a certain way. Um, the, the shadow side being not being emotionally grounded, um, which made it fairly easy for me to blend in. And um, I was always socially very clearly engaged on the side of the people who needed it. So um, I, I, I dare say that I have never been aware no no i've never been consciously superior or in power situations i'm i'm a good teacher i can explain quite well so whatever we did got across i never ever work alone i hate it yeah i always work with people um and um so i i always have mixed teams mm -hmm. i was always the bo uh, no, no i was often the boss um, and I think what suits that is um, my ability to, to, to think out of the box, to, you know, look to the alternatives, mm -hmm. the greener side, yeah? Um, and that's quite easy. So uh, with, this, with this little bit of critical mind, I can see what's going on, but I can also see, okay, there's something not right or missing, or we could do it in a different way, yeah? You and that is what, what comes very easy to me. Mm -hmm. And as I explain why and what not, um, it was, it was uh, okay, I have, of course, I mean, I have 
discovered myself that I thought, okay, if in the building construction, the idea of the right angle is not yet there, is not there, then that has impacts on how people systematize. Yeah. Um, and so there was this, the, yeah, or there, there is probably still this kind of who has it and who has not got it, um, who is where, and the identification of the otherness. And I think I can leave the otherness, I can let it be. Yeah, I can, yeah. Because <laughs> in the end, the difference between my parents' generation and me, and the difference between me I, my, my, and my Tanzanian colleague is at best similar, but I'm, I think I'm closer to my Tanzanian colleague than I am to my parents in mm. many, many ways. Okay, and so you did learn that skill that you were looking for, which is to take sort of that, that judgment and that stuck sort of self and put it in a box? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. yeah. And uh, I mean, uh, of course, I, <laughs> I have something like a subconscious and something comes up, yeah, and, and then I make terrible mistakes, of course. Yeah. And I often can just sort of say sorry and explain why, what was happening. Mm -hmm. but that is the same here, same here. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm wondering, um, I know that you don't practice Gestalt as a psychotherapist. That's not what you do, right? Has that something you've ever done? Or why is it that you've chosen to not do that? <laughs> because I'm not, a psych I'm not a psychologist. Tally and Tally said about five times, he doesn't do clinical therapy. He, he's an organizational person, organizations. And I said, okay. And now I'm wondering, I'm How, just what? learning. I'm learning it now. Okay. Yeah. Um, I um, I've joined in. So I, I moved back from Cape Town to Berlin only last year, 2019. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's still clear my my partner is still in in Cape Town. So I commute like a swallow. You know, summer here, summer there, um, and that is it's very fine because now it seems almost our kids are out of the house the last one even i've got four and um so the um opportunity arose for me to come back to berlin and um to get back into the flat that i own um and by chance one of the founders of this old Gestalt Pedagogics Institute, who has been a therapist mainly for groups in Berlin all these years, he said, I'm 77 now, I want to look into my legacy and I run a training course for group therapists. And I said, oh, group I know, <laughs> therapy I don't, <laughs> so let me see what I can pick up. And it's not recognized, it's not certified, nothing. But he's, he's, in a certain way, a brilliant guy. And he brought 30 people together who wanted to do this course, yeah, for two years. Mm. And it is absolutely fantastic. Absolutely. I discover things that are, yeah. And this is my first time to practice therapy. And we do this in groups, and we do four groups. Groups I have no problems with, but the therapy part, I'm really learning. But there are enough fully trained individual therapists in this group um, from whom I can learn quite a lot. And I can teach them quite a lot about how to deal with groups, mm -hmm. any size. So it's, it's, really, it's really mutual and very, very fertile. But that is my first time to do this. And I think it is extremely important because even if you work on an organizational level, you always also interact with individuals. And to be able to see what's going on, where is a person at, and to, to respond in a non-reactive way 
but in a supportive way uh, or in a challenging way, whatever is adequate, I think is extremely helpful, extremely helpful. So I'm very proud at the age of 70, I start a new career. Good. <laughs> <laughs> You seem to have lots of energy to sustain it, so I'm, yeah, I'm sure it goes somewhere interesting. Mm -hmm. So within the work that you were doing or are still doing, what were some of the most challenging situations that you ran into where it was either a personal limit or a professional limit that really stood out to you? Um, I mean, the, the one I described already, yeah, uh, to get biased, which is very easy. Um, it's fairly easy you, to be biased against slavery. Um, it's, it's it, a little... Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's always there's one side, but there's the other side as well. And yeah, <laughs> so, so um, if you have a if you have a, a purpose, and the purpose has some has to do with making change happen making improvements, yeah, bring kind of development, then um, we need to sort out how it works. Uh, what, is, what, is a, um, what is a step forward and what is, yeah, and is there, yeah, so my, my correct kind of response would have been at this stage with the slavery would have been, oh, that is surprising to me. Tell me how this came about. And is there anything that we can do specifically for that group yeah, rather than getting woo inside myself and yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, but it's a very visceral reaction. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, so it would be sort of more supporting. Yeah, yeah. Within yeah. than taking apart. Okay. And that's that's what I learned now in this in this group therapy. Yeah, that if people get very annoyed, um, to to hold the group and hold the space and allow it and and not go into myself. So that. That's very, very helpful. But um, I want to come back to what I said in the beginning. I always had the challenge that I feel so insecure in myself. Yeah, if I, um, that, that I do not have a feeling of a very solid emotional base, a safe haven where I can retreat to. I get, waving and two conflicts. So that's, that's the personal side. Um, to find more of that, and for that I'm quite old, yeah? So it's, it's not so easy to develop this. And I really admire colleagues who, yeah, who can say, oh, what a nonsense, why do you talk like this? And I am, yeah, and I, I, I can't easily do that. Um, and this, this uh, therapy group that I have joined is really helpful for, for that. By the way, the, the guy works, um, his name is Martin Rubeau, and he works um, a little bit like Irv Polster has described in his little brochure, 2015, I think, on um, Gestalt Beyond Therapy, mm -hmm. working with life focus groups, which is very, very similar to what he does, uh, what Martin does here. It's, um, if you want to characterize it very briefly, it's um, a replacement of a very, very good and well-functioning parish community okay. where people can go and deepen the experiences that they have in everyday life, which is very rushed and they don't do it on their own, where they have a community, a, a group, a trusting group, and um, where they can then go deeper inside themselves and learn from very human experiences like work-life balance, like death in the family, like difficulties with children and so on. Jealousy um, from others, yeah? And it's, it's a very, very fertile thing to do. I think that, that, by the way, is one of the areas which I wish Gestalt would go into, gestalt mm -hmm. therapists would go into, because it's also economically rewarding. You can, for the tenth of the price of a therapy session, you can offer four hours a long evening with 20 participants. You still earn more as a therapist, 
and the gains, if you know how to run this, mm -hmm. what the rituals can be that make people feel stable and so uh, the gains are tremendous. Um, the other challenge that I had was that I found conceptually not enough supported with the work that I was doing. So if you deal with power situations and you have the top dog underdog model, then I can explain individual behavior a bit better or understand it a little bit better. But if you have traditional systems where there is a patriarch and everybody is underneath and nothing has changed for the last 2000 years, then that doesn't work anymore. There's much more behind it. If you have strongly almost feudal systems, yeah, like you have, for example, in India with the castes, the top dog underdog is irrelevant, basically. Yeah, it's much more the caste system that matters and the differences, and in this, in this um, case, the difference in hygiene standards that it is built on. Other difference, uh, differences in society are not built on hygiene standards, but for example, on ownership of land or so, mm -hmm. yeah? or animals or whatever, on knowledge nowadays. So the power situation you cannot explain only by a psychological explanation. So, and that is with many other issues as well. The core one is for me, the systems paradigm that Gestalt uses, which is organism. Yeah, and from the chaos theory of Maturana, we know it has to do with a biological approach. But if you think of your own family, if you think of husband, kids, siblings, parent generation, cousins, whatever you have as a family, yeah, um, that's not really an organism. It is a bloody field of work that you have to do to keep that together. Even the, the small family is a field of work, yeah? To keep your husband-wife relationship sorted and going and in order and so on. So the, the, the organism model does not function for anything beyond a physical being. And even there, I think it's not right. It's not helpful because there's one question that the organism model does not answer, uh, not ask. It's the question, what does this entity hold together? What holds it together? And that was Sonia Neves' clever idea of the small systems to say, let us look what drives this system. If you have a family, you do not look at the individuals, you look at the family as an entity, whole, and you ask the question, what drives this very family in this very moment? or an organization or a team, yeah? And I think that is a much cleverer way of asking that question. Now, there is a, a German sociologist who died already in 1997. His name is Niklas Luhmann, and he has developed a completely different systems theory, which is not based on elements that are together and in their togetherness are more than the addition of each element. He says, it's not the togetherness that makes a system. It is the differences that make a system. It is where do we say we are different to what is not us. So the distinction is the driving force of system formation. What the system is, then needs to be identified very specifically in each case. So there's no levels of systems because an organization is a different kind of system to a community, to a network, to an interaction system. And an interaction system is um, what Kurt Levine calls 
a field. So the whole system fields thing is, in my view, not convincing. Um, and I think we need to work with both anyway. Yeah. And there's a new approach by a French sociologist who has also died in 2004, Pierre Bourdieu, on field theory. Much more complicated than only looking at a group and what is influencing a group who interacts. Yeah. So um, my second thing is to contribute to conceptualization of Gestalt so that it becomes more manageable in the larger field of work. Not only as a psychotherapist, but if even if we work in organizations, the organism is not there. Yeah? An organization is a machine that makes decisions. That's all it is, basically. Yeah? And so, and one can explain how that works as a system. It's very different to an interaction system, which is the predictability of the other that determines whether I am interacting or not. So um, these different kinds of systems are highly interesting, I find. So I've, I've started to write articles. My first one is, um, is in print in, um, in the Gestalt Review with Joe Melling. Um, the second one I've drafted and uh, it's being edited because I need somebody mother tongue and whatnot. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I want to do one on, on power because the power model doesn't work, yeah. On um, the cycle of experience, where I think it's, it's worthwhile to integrate David Cope's learning styles into the cycle because they, they are the same rationale, completely the same, yeah. Um, and suddenly we would have a tool to say, oh, you are at this point in the cycle and yeah, habitually. So um, I, I find that kind of work really fascinating. And my challenge is I'm a terribly bad writer. I can <laughs> talk, for writer. but I, I can't put it on paper. It's, I get too much distracted. And uh, mm -hmm. if, I have a, if I have a face to look into and I can explain something, fine, I can do that. But hmm. to write it, oh. Interesting. Some, some people have gone for the, please transcribe my lectures. And then from there, they take the book. Try that, try that. No, <laughs> I can only develop it in, in, in connection, yeah? Then, yeah. Okay, well, I, I, I'm actually, I'm sort of discovering that my own interest is in the organizational area. So I'm just sort of, sort of sitting here listening to everything that uh -huh. you're saying. Uh -huh. Those are a lot of the questions that I, I don't hear clinical people always come into. Yeah. And it, it's it's what is the bond? What is the drive? What is what is the nature? Why is this like this? It, uh, yeah, very interesting. <laughs> and I, I'm also wondering um, because you've pretty much taken yourself through the entire flow of the the conversation, which is lovely. Um, but the the one question that I do have is what what would be some of the things that have gone very well for you? What would be some of your greatest memories or achievements or moments where you've just gone, I've really enjoyed this. Um, the first one is um, what I've already mentioned, to have brought Gestalt back to Africa. And I, I meet people from training courses, basically. That's what I did quite a lot. Who say, you know, we didn't realize at the time, but now when I have changed and adjusted my ways, I realize that I have learned from this situation with this man. And that was so crucial. So I'll give you one example. I have a, I have a, colleague, um, a former colleague from Berlin who married uh, somebody in South Africa. 
and we, I went to visit her the other day and she said, you know, when you were sitting in Berlin in the team with John and Nathaniel and, um, and you were smoking like hell and you were discussing half of the night about how do we do this? And everybody had ideas and it, this is how I, st I stood in the corner for hours and I just watched how you facilitated these things. I've learned all that I know from on facilitation from that situation. So that is, and, and that's just one of the examples where I think we, we have impacts which we often don't trace and they come back to us, yeah, occasionally. Um, so two of these colleagues who I brought into the Gestalt things are now part of the faculty of the now the, the follow-up of the uh, Cleveland o OSD program, which is called iGold. So that is very satisfying for me. Um, the other one that I want to mention is something that is not related to Gestalt, but in a certain way, it's related to emergence. Um, when I was a planner in Tanga in Tanzania, um, we were we were linked to the budget cycle, the government budget cycle, which has a beginning and an end, uh, usually 12 month period, uh, often from January to December or from April to March, whatever it is, yeah. And um, there was a visitor from the German bank for reconstruction who came and she said, look, we are now already in October. That was when the weather got bad here and it was very nice in Tanzania and we had a lot of music. And she came and said, we have 2 million Deutschmarks in our budget and they were dedicated for Brubo and we can't spend them because something's gone wrong. Do you have an idea? And I had an idea, which again by chance came from a couple of months before a group of students from the University of Dar es Salaam visited and said, we need to do a practical, do you have a task for us? And I said, yes, you are 10 people. I want you to go to different ecological areas and investigate the potential use of bicycles. That was the, the time of the foundation of OPEC and the oil crisis. And I saw people pushing self-carved wooden bikes through the sands 20 kilometers in order to get their, their bag of maize to the next market. So that was a good investment and we researched women and uh, on the coast, the Muslims and um, hilly conditions and what kind, yeah. Just sort of, I sent them to four different villages and I said, how much, how many bicycles would they need? A simple question. And would they be able to do it? Then I had this little study. I pulled the study out when this lady came and I said, bicycles. And we imported one bicycle kit per family. That was a hell of a lot. It was 200,000 bicycles for, for yeah, 200,000 bicycles for um, a million people. And we didn't import bicycles, we imported bicycle, bicycle kits. Mm -hmm. Everything that you need for a bicycle in a box. And then we organized, distributed over the, the, the landscape people under the trees to sit and put these bicycles together. By that, they learned how to put bicycles together. So and you then also sold the bicycles. Repair shops and training. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you did, didn't need a lot of training. But um, then we sold the bicycles and because of the exchange rate was very weird, we got all the money back. And from that time on, this region is in the whole country, the bicycle region the bicycle region, because it was enough bicycles beyond the threshold that even the traditional Indian traders could import spare parts and new bicycles to replace and whatnot. And the next season, I was in the, in the, in the, national, in the um, provincial assembly and the provincial head of government accused me of supporting smuggling. And the point was 
that cardamom, which was not, which was only produced in the mountains on our side, suddenly was sold in Kenya and it appeared in the Kenyan export statistic. Substantial. And he said, this is your thing. You You're made that smuggling. happen. So you have made people contravene the law. And I said, yes, yes, sir. <laughs> All in Swahili. I said, yes, sir. You know the difference between a good problem and a bad problem? This is a good problem because we have too much. Always good. If we had a bad problem, people would die. This nobody is dying. Somebody is gaining not as much as they could because they smuggled it to Kenya. And, but that's the exchange rate. So nothing we can do. <laughs> and it was very fine. So that is for me just an example. I did something and I did not do it. Yeah, It so happened because the circumstances were right and it just worked out well. But you facilitated. Um, and that is what, what I think often happens. Yeah, it's to, to get into this field of oh, what is emerging and what is emerging in the, in the larger environment mm -hmm. to be sensitive to that. I think that, that's a very important part for me. Well, thank you. <laughs> I, I'm wondering if there's anything else that you would really like to add at this particular point. Maybe one little thing. I believe that the, the perspective for Gestalt and the potential of Gestalt, because it can work on so many different systems, the potential of Gestalt is underrated and unknown, mm. substantially. So I think we need to get out of the therapist bubble and expand not only into organizations, but in other fields of work so that we have an impact on what happens in the environment, what happens with, with violence against women, not only on an individual trauma level, also that of course, but also on a structural level. So, we as Gestalt um, people in, or practitioners in our paradigm are very much biased towards the agency that we have. Yeah, we can do things, we can change, we just need to want it, we need to go deep and then this, yeah, then things will be better. And I think we need to get aware of all the structures. That structures matter. And because structures matter, we have not explored that field enough. So we leave, for example, the massive influencing of human minds, for example, as voters. We leave to such scumbags as the company Cambridge Analytica. And I can only recommend to read this book of this whistleblower, Christopher Wiley, which is called Mindfuck, mm -hmm. on how they manipulated voters systematically, how that works with Facebook and other networks, which are actually not really networks, yeah, if you want to. But um, I think we have the potential to do good rather than to destroy on a much bigger scale than we, we think we do at present. Hmm. We have the potential, but we need to get into the mechanisms of that sort. How can we influence structures? How can we deal with this? That we have an impact, but not for the destruction, but for the construction. Hmm. Hmm. And you can hear me thinking. I'm just, I can hear you thinking. <laughs> you can hear me thinking. Yeah. I, I, will, I will leave it at that with your words, because I don't have anything to add to them. But I really appreciate this. 
and I appreciate what you've been saying. And it's been very interesting to meet you. So thank you. If it's okay. Thank you. Um, it was a pleasure. Good. Good, good, good for me too. Greetings to Camilla. Yes, I will say hi for you. Okay.